Thanks everyone for having me into your office today. Um, we're going to be filming a presentation that will be shared out to schools around uh, all of Canada and hopefully businesses as well. And the whole point of this is actually just to show people what is happening on the ground. Uh, we're going to look at some projects that are going on around the world. And we're also going to look at some of the things that I got up to over the last seven years and the people that we were able to learn from with my old organization along the way. So this uh, video is designed to be uh, shown after watching A Plastic Ocean, the movie. Uh, it is available on Netflix and uh, Apple TV. And as well, we have a 22 minute condensed version uh, for schools that hopefully will be screened before this. All right, so Plastic Oceans, who we are in Canada. Plastic Oceans, our vision is basically building awareness and fostering solutions. So our primary objective is to get that film out there to schools. Uh, we've got uh, an educational supplement that goes along with that and a social enterprise program for students to start their own project once they're inspired. Um, fostering solutions, we're going to actually look at how we're going to do that um, throughout the presentation. That's going to happen through either minimizing people's plastic footprint and also small grants that will go on the ground for local organizations around Canada. Because the good thing is we already have a lot of uh, organizations around and they might have been working on other things with conservation, but now that the topic of plastic pollution is huge, they're all starting a similar project. So we want to make sure we don't reinvent any wheels. Our concerns, basic ones, are environmental impact and human impact. But you can go to the website and see all these stats. Um, but why Canada is important is we're really a coastal country, as most people would know in Vancouver. We've got the Pacific Ocean right there. Um, over on the East Coast, the Atlantic, the North, Hudson Bay, and then tons of great lakes and rivers that will actually lead to the ocean one day. Some of our programs, again, all on the website. You can see our social enterprise program. It's a free download. Industry program and how businesses can be involved. Ambassador program if you're passionate in your community and want to get the message out there. Even something as simple as screening the film and playing this presentation. It helps us out a lot so we don't have to meet everyone ourselves. So our priorities for 2019, because everyone wants to know where any money is going to go if somebody's going to donate or engage, is extending that outreach through schools, community presentations, and resources that we design. Uh, we want to supply people, schools, and businesses with the tools to phase out single-use plastics in their life. So how that works is basically think about when you go shopping, most people are going to have a reusable shopping bag in their car, right? Um, but not a lot of people think about natural linen, right? Because a lot of those bags are going to turn into plastic pollution one day. So we want to focus on more natural fibers. As well, think about your produce bag when you grab those ones off the roll, right? How many bags do you use a week getting bulk food or even just your carrots and your apples and such? So we supply these packs and that's a fundraising tool. Something like a bamboo cutlery kit, you know, you can't really take a metal fork and knife on a plane because they'll think you're going to stab the captain. So they don't let you do that anymore. And a collapsible cup. Actually, Mitch was the first one to show me one of these. Um, everyone in Canada's probably got uh, a takeaway cup, but no one wants to bring it with them everywhere because it won't fit in their pocket. So this is just a little travel kit, the basics to phase out single-use plastics in people's lives. Um, we're going to pilot out our small grants program. Uh, through our fundraising, once we get money on the ground, we want to start putting projects in place. That can look like a few different things, and we're going to see some of the ones that we've worked on in the past and how that'll look in Canada. Uh, and then we also want to create a national database, like I was talking about how there's local organizations around Canada already working on this topic. So we don't want to reinvent any wheels. What we really want to do is focus on who's winning and um, support them in their efforts. And this is a prime example of that. If anyone's ever done a beach cleanup, they've probably co uh, collaborated with the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. This is run by OceanWise and WWF. So OceanWise is Vancouver Aquarium and WWF, World Wildlife Fund. That's a pretty big one. And these numbers up here, that's just 2019 so far. Um, we're going to show the numbers of what they've done over the last 25 years. But this is a great resource if you ever want to do something as a, as a company and get out there and clean up a beach somewhere. Um, you can get all the tools you need on this website about how to organize that, what you're going to need for supplies, data collection cards, which is super important, and you can submit it to them. Um, and then the three different ways that you can support us. Obviously, we're a national charity, so you can make a tax-deductible donation if students want to do a fundraiser, uh, if businesses want to use their, uh, their charitable giving, uh, that can be tax-deductible. I come from the field in a social enterprise model, so I've never really been able to work on that, and I also never believed in it in the beginning. So I've always set up things where people can join us on an expedition. Think about a corporate retreat, right? Team building exercises and go out and learn about what's happening on our coastlines, our Great Lakes. Um, phase out single-use plastics in your life, like I was saying with these packs. They're each $25, and $5 of that is actually profit that'll go to the organization. 
Um, people have all these products on Shopify and little zero waste stores, but you're actually going to save money getting it through us. And mostly with those stores, it's all drop shipping. So you're actually getting a lot of uh, single use plastic waste just by purchasing off those ones. So please do help us out if you want to get any of that. So we really want to use this as our primary fundraising tool because it makes people the solution from home. So we've already got schools that are buying these packs 200 at a time and they phase out single use plastics at home. And think about that as an, as an employee buying as well. That one passionate person in an office can go around, get everyone to buy a pack and then we can just deliver that sort of 20, 50 at a time. And it's, it really works on a lot of different levels. Uh, so that's how that can look. Uh, this is a school over in Nanaimo, and right there we put, we support Plastic Oceans phase-out single-use plastics and co-brand that because it's the whole team together. If people are just buying them by themselves, we've got that I support. All right, so Plastic Oceans, and this is my old organization, Ocean Ambassadors. We've teamed up because, um, as I was saying a little bit before, my background isn't standing in a room talking to people, explaining the issue. I, I come from the field. We worked on the ground. So what we're going to do is look at the last seven years and uh, the different people that we learned from along the way, the governments that we worked with, and programs that started to pop up that we tried to implement um, throughout that journey. So this is our history. If you want to go and look at oceanambassadors.org, you can see all that. There's usually links for everything. And the slides are really going to do the talking here, so I'm not going to kind of walk through there. But I want you to understand of how much this work really affects you as a person. You know, this isn't a, a normal job where you get a wage, and it really uh, it changes who you are. So we're going to take a look at what I looked like in 2012. This is what happened. So 2012, I was young and healthy, excited about life, wanted to get out there. When all of a sudden this turned into a real job, this is what I looked like from 2014 to 18. Right? It got real out there. You know, we're overworked, underfinanced, and still just trying to make projects hit the ground. I almost uh, threw the towel in and walked away around the time that I moved back to Canada in 2017. Then I decided to stay in the fight, and this is the persona that I took on. You know, it was just more like, you know what, this is just going to happen, and everyone's just going to love it. You know, this is what's going on. If we get everyone in Canada to start minimizing their single-use plastic footprint, this is what will happen. I will metamorphosize into a half unicorn, half dolphin with a tramp stamp of of my boat right there. So I just want everyone to focus on that. We're going to recap here. 2012, 2014 to 18, uh, 2018 to about now, and now we're stuck somewhere in between here and some days somewhere in between here. I don't think we're ever going to get back there. <laughs> All right, so in 2012, I bought this boat. This is sailing vessel Moana. Um, this was long before the movie, so they actually made the movie about us. Uh, and this is in the Vavau group of Tonga. And originally, the idea was, I'd been living down in the South Pacific for a lot of years. We were talking about just the love of nature. Um, I had the best job. I took billionaires surfing and kite surfing, scuba diving. It wasn't that bad. Um, but then I just realized that we were actually hurting these places more than we were um, helping them. So I wanted to change my career over to making them better. So we wanted this to be a floating classroom for the Green Island Project. And <laughs> To, to design a whole green island, you have to start looking at all your sources for power and you know, um, changing those over into energy or food sources and how we compost. And who's confused looking at this? <laughs> I've been looking at that for about eight years and I'm still confused. So the point was, what we found after that first tour was that we'd focus on one topic, one thing that could actually work. And that ended up being plastic pollution. At the time, I didn't really know much about it other than it just being a physical object in the ocean and maybe a bit of entanglement with sea life and, and seabirds. But there was an organization in Vancouver called Upgyres and they were looking at how to actually clean the ocean. Much like you've heard of probably the ocean cleanup and we're going to look at what they've done over the last seven years. But um, these guys were trying to figure out how to do that. I had a boat, I lived in the South Pacific. so. I wanted to focus a lot on how we stop it getting there in the first place, and they wanted to trial out some technologies of extracting it, so we teamed up. Um, and then in 2014, boat was in Australia, and we met this handsome fella here, Tim Silverwood. Uh, he's from an organization called Take Three, and has anyone ever heard of Take Three? It's pretty big, um, mostly over there, but it's getting global, and this, the message is simple. Just take uh, three pieces of trash anytime you're walking outside. I mean, everyone lives on the beach there, so it's more of a beach cleanup initiative but it is happening everywhere. I think as Canadians, we kind of do that. If we see other trash, if it's not super dirty, we'll bend down and pick it up and put it in the bin. And that's how their organization started. It's just that simple message. But uh, they're really, really, really good at putting on community presentations, beach cleanups, taught us all about data collection and how important it is to write down what we're finding and how um, we can actually get change from that. 
And our side of that, because we were working on sort of solutions, was things like turning pl waste plastic into alternative fuels. So has anyone ever seen this technology? You might have seen it on YouTube, but we can actually gasify waste plastics back to an alternative fuel, because plastic is made from oil, right? And if we start looking at the numbers, because a lot of people will start thinking, hey, you know, it's going to take more energy than you're going to create. But if we actually heat up plastic one kilogram to 420 degrees Celsius, we'll get one liter of oil. On a commercial scale, that's going to take one kilowatt hour of energy. Um, and you can generate 11 kilowatt hour of electricity with that one liter of oil. Uh, so you're actually gaining 10 units of energy when you're doing that. So we're taking that negative and turning it into a positive, something that we can use and have a demand for every day. Obviously, we want to look at alternatives, but you know, this machine was actually just sold to a school in Canada. We shipped it up from Tonga earlier this year, and it's in Haida Gwaii right now. Haida Gwaii is powered off diesel generators. It has the world's garbage arriving on our shores. So we could actually set up a program, and we're, we're trialing that right now, where we're gasifying the plastics arriving on our shores to power the community. So that's the solution, right? Something else that we looked at was, um, everyone's probably heard of recycled plastic apparel. You know, a lot of companies are making uh, recycled plastic clothes, shoes out of marine debris. Um, back then, people were just starting it out, and I thought, hey, well, why don't we actually turn that into a closed loop? We can fill a container for 40,000 pounds of plastic bottles, and that'll turn into 10,000 units of standard clothing. Uh, that's what we were actually trying to do. We were working with these places that we went to and trying to set up these collection points, and the clothes would create the profit to, for us to invest in another one. We moved on from that at the time because inventing waste management in a developing country is extremely difficult, a lot more than most people would think. Getting um, those rural communities to actually manage the operation, we were just getting zero consistency. We weren't getting just bottles in there, and we didn't have enough to actually get it going uh, smoothly. And then at the end, all nylon clothing actually sheds microplastics into the wash stream. So we might be taking that bigger physical side and turning it into something, but we're actually, every time we wash it, putting microplastics back into the ocean that'll actually come into our food stream. So that's all nylon clothes, and it's something that you want to think about. Um, so everything that we do right now is contributing to waste plastics in the ocean. Uh, so this is the plan there. Um, we wanted to take this negative, turn it into a positive. And then my old guiding company was called Leisure Activist Group, so we kept that name. That was more about being an activist of leisure, not a lazy activist. So just to clear that up there. Going into shedding microplastics in the wash stream, we actually found a Canadian technology last year that potentially could scale and go into municipal wastewater outflows and capture those, those microplastics. If you look here, that's actually um, a thread of fiber of nylon clothing right there and up here. And that's actually magnets. And that's about a five second pull in crystal clear water in Tonga. And it's actually attracting the waste plastic to that rod. So if we start thinking about these things and putting them in place, you know, we can start with a small town, getting in the wastewater outflow, chucking that rod in there and all the water that's coming out of everyone's washing machine, we could actually capture those microplastics before they go to the ocean. Um, now getting down to the science of it, once again, I'm operations, so I always get other people to explain how these things work. Uh, James R. McFarlane is, is another great Canadian. He's actually from Port Coquitlam. Uh, they have international submarine engineering. They've built all the submarines for the Canadian government and he's worked on conservation all over the world. So let's look at that. He, he took a look at this uh, technology, and from what he understands, the system is designed to capture particulate matter through the use of magnets. This collection device would get ferrous metals and maybe some non-ferrous metals because plastic is not actually attracted to a magnetic field, right? He's guessing that the static charge built up from that rotation is what pulls the plastic in, or if the magnets add to the static charge and if metal shavings are catch capturing that plastic on the way. Regardless, it could be something very important to getting plastics out of water. All right, so that's how that actually works. Um, after Australia, we headed out on the Clean Oceans Tour. Um, it was all still exciting back in those days. Um, we got out to Lord Howe Island, and if you watch the movie A Plastic Ocean, you would have seen Dr. Jennifer Lavers here, and she's pulling waste plastic out of seabird's stomachs. Right here, this is in the middle of the night, she's got a baby flesh-footed shearwater pumping the stomach full of water so they'll actually puke that plastic out. She's been doing this study for 15 years. She's devoted her life to it, of actually saving just this species and other programs around the world. She's Canadian. Let's celebrate that, you know? A Canadian scientist out in the field from Edmonton. Um, and now she's been out on Midway Atoll, Lord Howe for 15, lives in Tasmania. She's leading the charge. Lord Howe Island is actually a world UNESCO heritage site. It's pristine. 
all the garbage that is generated there goes back to the mainland in Australia. So why do they have endangered species dying of plastic pollution? Upstream, we've got Norfolk Island. Um, this is where all the, the descendants of the mutineers on the bounty live. Great people. If you ever have a chance to go to Norfolk, it's awesome. But they don't have any support. They're independent. So all of their trash gets put into one pile and burned on the side of a cliff. Then a bulldozer comes along and pushes that ash pile off the cliff. So what we find is a lot of half-charred plastics. This is just, so the cliff would be about right here, and that was about five minutes walking up and down the beach next door. Ocean currents, winds and everything, that takes that downstream, ends up at Lord Howe Island, and now we've got an issue in a, in a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, from there on the Clean Oceans Tour, we went due north uh, to Vanuatu. And has anyone ever been to Vanuatu? Does anyone want to win a Darwin Award? Stand on top of a volcano and have lava spurting out in your face? Go to Vanuatu, it's awesome. Um, we went up there, it's an independent country that they kicked out the French and the British in 1981. And so they've struggled along the way, they don't have a lot of support, that means zero waste management. Um, so their beaches are just absolute trash. One thing that's cool about being independent is they start to think outside the box. They're already uh, using coconut oil to power their generators for municipal power all the way through the whole country. And we can actually combine that waste plastic oil to coconut oil and make a really effective uh, fuel for generators. It's a perfect little mix right there because you have the bio side and then you have the synthetic side coming together. Um, Vanuatu is leading the charge. Pretty much every week I see a headline about what they're doing to minimize waste plastics in their country. So definitely look it up, and if you want to see a live volcano, go to Tana. Um, from there, we headed off to Fiji. Uh, this is where we ended up staying for four years to try to put these things on the ground. Originally, the Australian High Commission asked us to stick around and put these programs, such as the fuel and the bottles, into clothing in place. And this is standing here with the Prime Minister of Fiji at the Fiji Fuel Retailers AGM. You know, we were actually trying to make every fuel station a collection point so we could actually start um, getting that plastic up in a stockpile and look at the numbers, see how much plastic we have that we could gasify back to alternative fuels. Put it in the diesel mix, like here in BC we've got biofuel content in our diesel. We could actually combine that over to their, their national uh, diesel system. And you probably can't read it from here, but that t-shirt does say, I support a clean Fiji and all I got was this stupid t-shirt. Four years later as I was leaving that country, it turned out to be true. All I got out of that four years was that stupid t-shirt. But that's fine, we'll see what that journey looked like. Um, to start all this recycling uh, systems in Fiji and trying to get everyone on board, we had to start at square one. All right, so first thing we do, education. Just much like we're doing here in Canada on a different level, um, getting it out there to the kids because they can take that message home, tell the parents how they're going to live their lives. If anyone's a parent in this room, they probably know about that. So getting stats out there, and if you think about that, this is how much trash enters the ocean every 15 seconds three metric tons of plastic worldwide. So that's this room wide and about eight long. That picture is from a museum over in Switzerland. Um, why not to burn it? Because we're in a developing country. Most people just put their trash on the beach and they just light it up on fire and let the high tide wash the rest of it back out. Some of the problems that were going on, how it ends up in our food stream, you know, because those microplastics are the size of plankton and it starts coming up all the way to us. Uh, got some activities in there, made it fun for the kids. So everyone likes a good word search, right? Um, and then data collection. As we learned from Take 3 and by doing this in other places, it was really important to write down what we're finding because that's where we can see where we have a problem. In Canada, the data collection we've actually found is that Tim Hortons products are the number one polluter in Canada. So does that mean Tim Hortons is doing a bad job? I mean, they're trying to make a business run, so we can't point a finger, but maybe get some messaging into, um, into their restaurants. I mean, like, hey, everyone. Our products are ending up in our rivers, at our lakes, going into the ocean. Let's do a little bit better, all right? So that's another thing is, with pla as plastic oceans, we're trying to find solutions for everyone. We're not going to point a finger. We actually want to make things better, and we always will find a way. Uh, getting corporate engagement in. So we're talking about a country with a population of a million. Um, we've got another million coming in just as tourists, and the hotels are creating a lot of that waste. Think about all the single-use water bottles you use when you go on vacation all the takeaway food and all of that. So tried to start explaining it to them uh, about all the benefits of why you would stop polluting your ocean, especially in a tourism country. You know, you don't want to have trash everywhere. Uh, business impacts, all about plastics, understanding what those different numbers mean. And then people that were in Fiji that already actually had recycling systems going. Everyone's like, oh, there's no recycling in this country. <laughs> like, well, 
this was five years ago. <laughs> you know, like there's actually that many people that will engage in recycling with you. Number one was Coca-Cola. Everyone always points a finger at the beverage industry, but they're the only people that had a container deposit scheme. People could go around on beaches, collect bottles, bring it back to the factory and get a dollar per kilo. That, that's jobs. They didn't want anyone to know about it because it cost them money, but we started telling everyone and it started costing them more money. Some wins that we got to see after four years just by people getting involved. Here's Captain Cook Cruise Lines. We didn't end up working directly with them. We tried in the beginning, it just didn't seem to work out. But what they did was they actually put something in place which was really cool. And people do a beach cleanup before they go snorkeling. If you ever end up in Fiji, you're probably gonna end up on one of their boats. They're one of the biggest uh, cruise ship operators and day trip operators. They've cleaned up over eight tons of waste plastic in just one year of people just voluntarily picking up a bit of trash before they go for a snorkel. Um, down here, we've got local organizations popping up. Fiji is the land of international aid and uh, environmental conservation offices. There's always just people throwing money at a problem and nothing really going on the ground. This was the first time we ever seen a local village start their own not-for-profit and manage it, and it was all about cleaning up the shorelines. And that kind of happened through those education programs and getting that message out there. Uh, we got to see a plastic bag levy come in. So everyone knows in Canada, we actually pay for plastic bags at the grocery store. So when you only make $2 an hour and you gotta pay 10 cents per plastic bag, you're gonna stop using plastic bags, right? So we saw a reduction right away. And that was the work of everyone. I mean, we were just in the room for a couple of the meetings, but to see everyone come together and just make that happen because of just full demand was pretty special. And here's the Prime Minister again with a job creation program, making reusable bags out of um, you know, old cloth, bed sheets and such. And that's creating jobs for women in islands where they would never have an income before. So now we've got job creation, we've got plastic minimization, and a cleaner ocean. So there's a lot of cool things that can happen here if people just work together. Uh, we also started volunteerism. I mean, what's better than going sailing in Fiji for four days or seven days on a traditional sailing canoe? Anyone want to go to Fiji for a corporate retreat? All right, so we've got, there's one week booked. And <laughs> that helps us get things on the ground, right? We don't just go out there and preach. We actually always hire a local partner and work with them to do that delivery. But um, we get people out there and have a lot of fun too. I mean, we go surfing, we go sailing, but then we go and we actually learn how this shows up on different shores and we look at wind patterns and how the ocean's moving. Uh, we're gonna look at what that was able to achieve in Tonga, actually coming up right here. So this is a really non-high def photo of my boat, uh, Moana. It's a double hull sailing canoe, I really miss her. I don't want to be in Canada anymore. I want to go back to my boat. Um, and this is what it looks like there. So crystal clear water, uh, white sand beaches, and you'd think that there really even wouldn't be a problem here. And I do want to point out here, yeah, we are using plastic garbage bags. It's because there's no um, reusable bags in the Vivao group of Tonga. As well, there's also no waste management. So when we do a cleanup, where are we supposed to empty those bags, right? So we had to contain them somehow. So I just want to get that out there. There is no perfect world. Um, so it looks picturesque, but at the end of the day, this is what's happening. This is arriving on his shore every single day. That's why he's so angry. It's either that or it's because he's wearing a sweater and it's like 35 <laughs> degrees. I can't really tell. But what we did there is we also implemented a little, we, the starting point of a microeconomy. This here is a, a grinder from the precious plastic model that we're gonna learn about later. And that grinds up waste plastic, so we starts the process of making Second Life products on the ground. It's a low-cost, high-impact program. It's job creation. People can pick up waste plastics in outer islands, bring them back to shore, and start making these things, um, and sell them back to the tourists. It's perfect. Here's your trash back. And this is what we were able to achieve, just with eight weeks of volunteers coming out to Tonga. We got to develop their local education program like we did in Fiji. Pretty much used the same uh, program and then just translated it. Uh, got to visit 15 communities, doing beach cleanups, data collection again writing down what's happening so we can actually show the government where the problem is. Uh, initiated that microeconomy, so we sponsored that first machine, VIPA, our local partner. Uh, they were actually fundraised for the second machine to make the, the finished products. And then we got interest from the local government. Um, normally they were just standing around and saying, how do we tackle this huge issue? But because we got out there and got a little bit of media and all these communities putting their hand up saying that they want to be a part of the solution, the government started listening. And lastly was um, a really big organization that a lot of people might have heard of is Parlay for the Oceans called up. And they've got a few mandates about protecting islands uh, in partnerships, which we'll learn about in this slide. And they're like, okay, well, how do we get on board here? How do we work with that program that's going on? So 
that was pretty special because Parlay for the Oceans is very big. They're the ones that work with Adidas on turning uh, ghost nets out in the ocean into shoes. So that first shoe that cost $75,000 to make by getting waste plastic out of the ocean and turning it into a shoe, um, they worked with them on that. They're also the ones that have that Corona 100 Islands Protected by 2020 program. You know, now that island that we were just working in can be one of those islands. Uh, so it's pretty important that we all work together, right, and use our strengths. Um, they work on corporate buy-in, we work on the ground. This is a little fun video. This year we sailed this boat with these people to help clean these islands. And to start the process of keeping them that way. If you'd like to be the solution from home, Sign up to Pirate Pack today. Every month, you'll get supplies to minimize your plastic footprint, with proceeds going to our local partners. Give yourself the best New Year's resolution for 2019. Resolution for waste-free ocean. Sign up to Pirate Pack and be the solution. I am an ocean ambassador. We are ocean ambassadors. I am the solution. High five humpback whales, anyone want to come? You, you're allowed to swim with humpback whales in Tonga. We've got one trip left in September if anyone wants to come. <laughs> so we designed that last year actually when I was back in Canada. And that was a program to minimize people's uh, plastic footprint. And that's some of that show and tell here. And when we talk about what we're bringing into plastic oceans with these single use plastic minimization packs, um, that's really just an offshoot of what we did with Pirate Pack. Uh, some of the rest of that's here. Uh, people don't really think about it, but in an office setting, just your tape alone, that's waste plastic, right? This is natural tree gum, non-cellulose tape. Uh, that's actually not going to pollute the ocean. Uh, also think about your Ziploc bags. Anyone ever think about that? You can actually get a reusable little thing here, and you can wash it. Uh, then there's, with Plastic Oceans, we're starting to get companies co-branding with us. Every single bamboo toothbrush ever sold is we get proceeds coming over to the organization. Uh, Instead of using cling wrap, beeswax food wraps. Anyone seen those on the interwebs? No? Yeah, so this is a great Canadi uh, Canadian company over in Toronto. <coughs> you get three packs. They're starting to do other products as well. So that was the idea was there's all these different products that are coming out, but people are like, how do I help from home? So you can actually get this and reduce your plastic footprint. All right, so the idea was you get cool stuff. Money goes on the ground. We all shake hands. Everyone's happy. All right, so we can skip through that. We've pretty much just looked at most of it. And here's some of the basic minimization numbers when you start reducing your plastic footprint. Everyone on average in Canada is using about 700 bags per year. That's shy of, that's actually less than two a day when you think about it. So when you start breaking it down, when you go to the grocery store, if you get these reusable kits, you're gonna reduce that many bags, just one person. Single use cups. Everyone's maybe got a cup in the office, but I did see a Keurig when I walked past, so. You know, that is going to create a lot of waste, right? Um, if you actually have a reusable or a better coffee system, you can reduce 720 per person a year. Uh, water and soda bottles, th these are the basic numbers. If you're not taking takeaway cutlery, you're not contributing to the 40 billion a year produced. And this is what it looks like in Canada. We've had a problem for quite a while, and we've known about it. In 2010, we knew that plastic waste was already polluting Manitoba. Right? Up here, that's, this is 2017. Um, where we're finding microplastics found in all supermarket fish and shellfish. This is what it looks like in our food stream. That's going into all of our fish. When you watch the movie, you'll, you'll learn about how we usually eat the whole animal when we've got shellfish and mussels. Um, that's not sand <laughs> and little grains of salt that you're biting into. That's microplastics in our food stream affecting our health. Also, our west coast is a dumping patch, our dumping ground for the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Think about it, you guys are working remotely, you're probably out in all these areas. We've got Haida Gwaii up here, Vancouver Island. And this is what it looks like. Uh, we've got local organizations working on the ground every single day. This is an outer island cleanup where they're filling up super sacks about this big. It takes a helicopter to get them off the beach. You know, we need support to get these things done, otherwise it goes back out in the ocean. This was taken in 2004. Just a nice lady filling up the whole back of her car of, of ocean plastics arriving on our beaches. And what it used to look like with just driftwood, that's, that's just reality every single day in Tofino and Eucula. We're going to go into major global efforts that people might have heard about. We're going to look at these numbers, um, see how effective they are and, or aren't. 
Uh, first one is the ocean cleanup. That was started back in 2012. And has anyone ever heard of the ocean cleanup? Um, young boy in Slat who's like, hey, I'm going to get out there and clean up the ocean. Um, so he got a bunch of support, did a little TED talk in the beginning, and the university that he was going to teamed up with him, and they put all their scientists and engineers and marketing into that, primarily marketing. And, um, and they raised actually $20 million US. And they only got their first deployment out in November. And we all know this does take a lot of time when you're talking about doing one of the, the hardest things in the world. But their idea was to put a five kilometer long array out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So if anyone's ever sailed a boat or driven a boat, and do you think you really want a five kilometer unmanned array just sitting out there as a hazard to navigation? Not really the best idea. As well, they've also got nets underneath here to capture the plastics. So we're going to have issues of bycatch with dolphins and whales. Um, and also the idea was to be unmanned. So who's out there to service any of this? Right? So there's a lot of kinks to be worked out. At the end of the day, they actually are answering the big question, why don't we just go clean it up? Because it costs $20 million to collect 1,000 kilograms of plastic. So they are going into second tests. Um, and this is what it looked like. They decided to do a big U. And the problem was all the plastic was just exiting out here. Who would have thought? That's how water works, right? Um, you know, this, we don't want to discourage ideas because we actually are working with a lot of youth. And even in May, we've got the kids in Langley um, might win $20,000 by inventing a program to minimize plastics. So we definitely need, need ideas, but we need to work them out before we start spending this kind of money. Not us, because we didn't spend that. <laughs> but um, also, this boom just snapped in half. If anyone's ever been out and felt the power of the ocean, and that's one of the reasons we do these expeditions, the ocean is powerful. You know, no matter how much you engineer that, if you just sit it out there on its own, it can't take that sort of stress. So that's what happened there. Um, another project is the Seabin project. Has anyone ever heard of that one? This is really cool. This was developed by a couple friends in Australia who worked on super yachts, and they noticed there was trash everywhere they went in marinas. So they thought, why don't we just put a bucket at the end of the marina and have a little vacuum attracting the water, and all the plastic can just go in there, and we can lift it up and clean it. So that's something that we can do as a small grant program in Canada. You know, think about the Great Lakes or even places like Kelowna, not just out in the oceans, right? Um, anywhere that's got a waterway, we could actually put that on the ground with a local organization and they can service it. And we can finance that all through selling these packs. So they, they did take a few years getting everything uh, worked out, which is fine because that's what happens with your engineering. But they've got a thousand sea bins out there worldwide for this year. And this is the goal. They're actually going to clean up 1,423.5 tons of other people's trash just by community driven projects. They can't physically be out there in all those different spots. They make the machines, right? This is all driven by the people at home. Uh, four Oceans, if anyone has a social media account, you've probably seen this one. You know, buy a bracelet and tell everyone you care. Um, again, numbers don't lie. They actually have cleaned up uh, 4,195,604 pounds of other people's trash by fundraising through selling these $20 bracelets. The problem is, this is going to turn into trash. <laughs> you know, these little beads are going to look like roe to fish that are swimming around, and that's going to go into our food stream. Um, it's a really reactive approach. I think as Canadians, it's not something, I mean, some people might, you know, you want to support. They're, they've got great viral videos, and they are cleaning up other stuff. But I think us here in Canada, we want to get more involved and actually be part of the solution. If we're going to spend 20 bucks, we want to actually stop more than a pound of trash a day entering the ocean, right? Or get out there with our friends and clean up other people's trash. So I want to compare some of these numbers, because we just looked at the ocean cleanup and four oceans. But this is the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup again. And this is some of the numbers that they've done over the last 25 years. And this is the main one I wanted to look at. 1.2 million kilograms of litter enter, uh, got out of our waterways in Canada just by people going out there for a cup of coffee and an orange slice. You know, this is what we do as Canadians. I think we get out there and do the right thing. I converted that over to pounds to compare it back to um, uh, four oceans, and we're averaging about 105,000 pounds a year just by community engagement. And that's only one organization taking data. That's not all the other community organizations that are going out there and doing beach cleanups. So I think on a whole, as a country, we're actually doing our part just by getting out there and being engaged. This is the precious plastic machine that um, some people might have seen online. Um, this is the one that we implemented in Tonga last year. Uh, this guy up here, is, he's an engineer. He decided to make really low-cost um, 
machines that you could actually just put in your backyard and start a recycling program. So you can go to preciousplastic.com and see how those all work, but for a really low buy-in, we can actually build these out of recycled materials and start a recycling program in a small community. And that can work somewhere like Tofino or even Nova Scotia, where we have ocean plastics arriving, people can do their cleanups, bring them back to the local organization, you can make little trinkets to sell back to tourists. That's gone viral. I mean, all of these spots around the world are people that have already built a machine or put their hand up looking for collaboration to get one going. Um, they've also got a bazaar on the website where you can actually on-sell your products or you can also buy the parts for the machine because not everyone has a laser cutter to make these blades or a motor or a compression molding oven. So you can, it's actually really, um, it's a good system where everyone can work together. Uh, Plastic Oceans Canada, this is our education program that goes with the film. This is the table of contents. It's, uh, it's free for all the teachers that do want to use that film or the 22 minute version. We also got the social enterprise program for people, not just students, but anyone that wants to start their own project. You know, social enterprise is designed to be not just like business. It's always going to have an impact for your community or helping out the environment. So it just helps you along the way of researching the problem, identifying the solutions, getting that business plan and how you can execute it. And then we're always available to help out with those as well. We're going to go down the line here and get everyone to read these out loud. Do you want to read this one for me? Yeah. Take personal accountability. So does everyone know what that means? Take personal accountability? You know, just don't be responsible for your own actions. You know, don't litter. Put things in the right bin so that we're not going to end up with trash in our oceans. Um, second down the line. Reduce your plastics footprint. Exactly. The number one thing you can do as a person is just start looking around the household. Start looking at ways that you can reduce your own personal plastic footprint. Exactly. Uh, we're in Canada. We've got great recycling infrastructure. It's getting better every day. So just use the bins. They pick them up from your house. It's not hard. <laughs> so just do the right thing. Support your local organization. Exactly. We've got organizations everywhere in Canada that work with the environment. Get out in your backyard. Find out who they are. Even just one day a year, you're going to support them. These people are working hard. They're not paid very well. Get out there and help them, please. Um, Support emerging products. Anyone want that one? Or support emerging products that offer more sustainable packaging. Exactly. So we talked about that a little bit with Pirate Pack. There's, um, you want to start looking at people that are using bioplastics. Again, bioplastics aren't really the answer, but at the end of the day, they will compost and go back to the earth if they're put in the right environment. Um, something like this. Um, this is Eco Nuts for your laundry. It comes in aluminum packaging. That's 48 loads of laundry in this right there. And that's actually just made from squished uh, Himalayan soap nuts things that grow on a tree and will actually clean your clothes just as good as Tide will. And you're not going to have all those chemicals going in the ocean or that plastic jug at the end of the day that probably can't be recycled unless you clean it out and put the, all those chemicals in. So there's always something, there's always a solution, right? So just research it a little bit. There's great products out there. That kind of covers that plant-based alternatives when I talk about uh, bioplastics. You know, we're making plastic alternatives out of algae, cornstarch, sugarcane, a lot of different things. We do want to make sure that you can recycle them at home if you're going to use them because actually I just was just told last night that BC we can't process bioplastics. So it's, it's not a one size fits all, right? Who's next? I think that's Stay connected with nature. Exactly. So all your field workers here exactly at this company, you know, you're, you're working outside. I mean, I remember when my dad was a lineman, he said that was the best job in the world because he was out in the most remote places of BC, climbing up poles and seeing the coolest stuff that he could ever imagine. So that's what's going to instill wanting to fix this and keep it all clean out there, right? Now it's a sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Order a plastic-free pack from Plastic Ocean. Exactly. Help us out. Help us help you, right? If you get the pack, you're minimizing your footprint, and we can start helping out these organizations around Canada. And lastly, this is a corporate retreat. Everyone. Yeah, exactly. So we're taking those fun things that we were showing you out in Tonga and Fiji and bringing them home. We are starting them out in Canada. Um, we can do that anywhere. Pick a spot, get a group of people together, and we'll find a local organization to go and work with. We'll look at putting a small grants program on the ground with the profit we'll actually get from that corporate retreat. And we'll have a little bit of fun, do some trust exercises if you want. Um, so I think that's it. Um, we just go back to how we can support. We've talked a lot about, about that. But I guess we'll just close on one little basic quote. I've been seeing this one go around Instagram lately. Do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. That's it. For, thank you.